Hello, I'm Fran Scott, engineering presenter, and we're going to be joined by photographer Ted Humblesmith. Ted was commissioned by the Royal Academy of Engineering to create a series of images that reimagined 10 incredible engineering innovations that have won the McRobert Award over the past 50 years. The McRobert Award was set up in 1969 and the first joint winners was the Rolls-Royce team behind the Pegasus engine that powered the Harrier jump jet and Bream and Fox and Partners for their design of the Severn Bridge. And since then, there have been all manner of winners from the CT scanner to the Raspberry Pi computer. We're going to go behind the scenes with Ted to see how we created these amazing images. So Ted, hello and welcome. Hi Fran. Hi. Um, now, I know that you're used to photographing things like stilettos and lipsticks, watches, like all manner of luxury goods. But when it comes to photographing engineering innovations, you've done something quite similar to this before, haven't you, for the great campaign with the Intellectual Property Office? Yes, that's right. Uh, a year or so ago, I got involved with the great campaign, conceptualising 400 years of patents um, of the Intellectual Property Office's history which was a truly fascinating journey from 1617 to the year 2016. How much of, let's say, the briefing comes from the commissioner or are you allowed to freewheel a bit? In my normal work, generally a, a, a brief turns up and it's quite tight. Um, in this particular project, it was very much a team discussion about what we could do and how it can work. And you've been talking about the team, because um, yes, I know the work had to be of engineering and the fellows, they helped you. But in terms of the team on the ground, what sort of size team did you have? It depends, really. There's a number of different people. I usually work with one or two lighting assistants who help me in my basically lighting kit, studios, cameras and all the rest of it. And then I usually team up with some set designers and model makers to actually help create and make what I'm using. But just collaborating with someone else, someone else's imagination um, just helps. It builds things and you then get a good discussion going creatively about what we can do and where we can go and just another vision that comes into it. So that's really, really useful. One thing I'm really intrigued by, Ted, is how you get your images to look so dynamic, even though they're a still image. That really intrigues me. Yeah, it's a tricky one to answer that because it's kind of just what I do. Um, I'm not really sure how that works. It's a, it's a long process of planning, shooting, building, lighting, retouching. Um, and each one of those stages just adds a little bit more, adds a little bit more. And I think the other part of it is you know, it's the last 5%, 2%, 1%, as with many things, if you just keep pushing just to get it right and you just keep going a little bit more this can be better this can be better this can be better i think that helps is it important to you to you know to continually improve your work from from one project to the other is there is there something you learned from earlier projects that you could then bring to this one i think this one had probably 22 years of experience and all of it came all of it turned up i think the one thing i learned recently more than anything really is to bring your enthusiasm and bring your interest and if you find a project which fills you with enthusiasm if you can then find members of your team who are also as enthusiastic as you you are going to get great results it doesn't matter what it is if everybody involved is just loving the idea of the job the work of the project then you're going to get fantastic results um, so you've got um, a few models, haven't you, of the winners? Like you've got a bit of a Seven, the Seven Bridge, uh, the British Gas Pig, a CT scanner. Um, could you show me a few of those models? Yeah, well, we you have to make all these things in order to photograph them. Um, Pegasus, which started out here, this was our um, prototype of, of the to show the airflow around the Pegasus engine, which we made of multiple different colours, so we could actually work out how to put it together. Um, I made this with a friend of mine now, Devon Tom, who's a great, a great maker of things, studied as furniture design as a trade, and now comes and helps me on ultimately anything that involves acrylic because he loves working with it and he's brilliant and uh, he's extremely precise, which is very useful. So we made up our model, first of all, our prototype so we could work out how it would work. Um, I think you've got some quite interesting behind the scenes footage of what I can only describe as a very Heath Robinson process here. And then once we had that working, 
we started on sort of the, the real model which we actually use for the shoot where you get the idea of the airflow going in into the engine and spinning round the sort of the curve we put into here was to demonstrate the idea of the actual jet engine functioning and then the airflow would come out these one two four main rotating nozzles here um, along with these puffer jets so my pilot friend referred to them at the extremities of the aircraft for balance so once we had that model made it made we just needed to balance it on a sort of something which represented the airflow down in hover mode really which was our little conical shape here have you got any other models there for us to have a look at i've got uh cat scan down here which is this rather shakespearean model here um we tried to, A, I tried to listen to everybody that spoke to me and work out what was going on with this. Uh, some very patient people tried to explain CAT scans and to the best of their ability, thank you to them. Second, I failed miserably in understanding really what was going on, I think. But I did take away, it was an x-rays, x-ray machine going the whole way around the head. And the, and the, the, the image built up slowly. You didn't get a full image until the actual end of the process. You couldn't just jump in halfway through and get half an image. Um, and you took a slither, a slice, a very small slice through the brain, and that actually enabled you to see what was going on. Before, if you wanted to do this, you actually had to slice a brain, put it on a light box. Um, obviously that had sort of issues for the patient. This way of doing it, everything worked beautifully and you could see. Truly remarkable invention um, and won a Nobel Prize. The model we use for this is our uh, medical skull translucent to try and give the idea that we've got x-rays going on in here because when you shot it with a certain light it very much looked like an x-rayed skull which was really nice. We then, the top was removed, our brain was inside and we had some acrylic shapes a little bit like a crown, four or five of them around here with little bits of silver foil on the end that when you spun them, spun all the way around and with a long shutter speed on the camera you got this lovely idea of a sort of spinning disc. It almost looked like a record at times. It's really interesting because when you actually, you know, say those objects and you're just like, oh, it's just Perspex images and some fishing wire and stuff. And you're like, how can you make all of that just look so, so uh, tangible, I suppose. And, and it explains how the, it's, it's incredible. Well done. <laughs> That's very kind of you to say so, but most of it comes down to light really um with with the right light you can make really the very mundane look magical it's a bit like cooking you get a, you get amazing ingredients you mix them in a bowl and put it in the oven and you get a great cake out the other end makes sense um slightly less edible your images though i would say um, <laughs> so there's definitely so lighting's important to you obviously your cameras will be important to you is there a certain camera and lens combination that you like to use um, I use a very bizarre camera. It's um, it's a complete sort of unique setup. I, I've never met anyone else who uses the same thing. Um, I use Schneider digital lenses, a Plowbell movements camera, and then a Phase One digital back. There's lots of other lots of people will use different cameras in in different ways, but um, it's it's a very beautifully engineered piece of kit and it's incredibly precise. You can change the planes of focus. You have a ability to um, have live view on the back of the phase one, which is great. So you can see on your big screen, um, when you're looking at it, you can actually see straight through what the camera's seeing. And that really helps you construct an image. So Ted, one of the many things I love about your images is you look at them and at first glance, they look like computer generated images, but these are photographs. Like what you see is what was actually there in real life, yeah? Yeah, 100%. Pretty much everything that's there was actually shot for real in the studio. Um, and you can see that in the example of the Quantel paint box. I think there's some behind the scenes footage of a bunch of very strange people wrapped up in white suits uh, depositing paint onto a curved, uh, curved fire glass fire guard to look like a screen. So you then have to take those bits and add them together. So where the post-production came in, the retouching came in, or the, is the airbrushing as it's sometimes referred to, is you, you shoot in at times in sort of in layers. 
So you, you then take those layers and put them and add them to the picture. But ultimately, everything that's in there is is an original photograph. And um, have you got any other models for us to have a look at? Yeah. Um, would look rather more at home in Matrix, I think. And uh, and I'm sure anyone that actually worked with intelligence pigs is looking at me right now, going, "You're mad," because it never looked anything like that. Um, and no, it didn't. It looked completely different. But what it was like, it was like putting your pipeline under a microscope. You could completely look at everything um, in minute detail. Absolutely remarkable. The whole thing worked uh, with magnetism, I'm told. And the analysis of the magnetic fields that went out and came back, you'd show up fractures or weaknesses in the pipeline. So you didn't have to send divers down. You didn't have to dig everything up. And so I'm a bit of a bridge fan girl. So one of the innovations that really intrigues me is, of course, the Severn Bridge. And do you have something to show us about that? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just be a minute. <laughs> what have you got? It's particularly heavy. Oh. <laughs> like that didn't... It? So that's the one we used for the shoot, which gave me a whole new respect for the seven bridge design because this is ridiculously heavy our pro our prototype luckily is sitting up behind me so this little guy it was it was something came to me after talking to mike parsons the designer of the bridge that it just felt like the whole thing was flying it was the the idea that the airflow would come over this over and under and the, sort of the bridge would have its idea of flight. And then this box section, just something jumped at me one day when I was sort of mulling it all over of a box kite. And the idea that you could have got this thing flying in the air. And that's where that whole idea came from. Once we looked at that, then we thought, actually, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, which was destroyed, which this design sort of led on from, or people's concern about sort of traditional suspension bridge design, we could have the tail in there, which gives the whole link towards the um, the flutter, I think it was called, or in Tacoma Narrows Bridge, severe flutter, I think. Um, and so it all suddenly kind of worked quite nicely, and it came together. We could have this idea of this box flying above everything, uh, which which was great fun to shoot. Just um, some very heavy wires. I don't know if this will be like saying to choose your favourite child, um, but do you have a favourite image from the ten? It, it, it changes on a daily basis, I think, when I can look at them. Um, each one had its challenges, um, whether that was in the research of trying to even vaguely understand how it worked or in the actual the, the fun of shooting the whole thing or building it or making it. Um, oh, looking at the images now, I mean, I love, the, I love the image we did with Rolls-Royce for the Pegasus engine. It's something that came to me very early on in our discussions, this idea of a, of a balance of airflow. Um, it was a very enjoyable process making it. It involved what a friend of mine from down in Devon, where I live, who helped me make all the airflow pieces. It involved one of my neighbours, who's a wood turner, who made the little spindle it sits on, and we made it all outside in the sunshine. It was it was a lovely process to create to create it. Um, and all the people we spoke to with with that was uh, they were they were fascinating. And I just think it's beautiful. You look at all the jet engines in the world of where they go, and the Pegasus is totally unique. Ted, out of these 10 innovations, is there one that means the most to you? I think the Quantel paint box really touched, uh, touched some heartstrings there, really, because I use a very similar thing every day. Um, I work on a pen and tablet when I'm retouching my images. Now, to me, that's something I've worked on now for 15 years. Now, somebody had to, first of all, come up with the idea of that's a way to work. Then they had to make, make it work. And after talking to Paul Keller, who was sort of the key in Quantel Paintbox, it was a fascinating discussion about the maths that was required to actually make that work the first time. Um, they had this idea that they wanted it to be able to work for real without a laboratory technician or a computer technician. The artists, or whoever was using it, it needed to be no barrier between artist and final work. So the idea of working on a tablet and pen was inspired, really. Absolute genius, and it's beautiful. And it's changed the way thousands of people have worked since. One of the biggest problems they had to begin with, apparently, was just drawing a straight line. 
you know, all computers we had back then, you, you drew a line on a computer screen and it went up like a step. Simple as that. Uh, to get it oh, get out of that and onto just a line required some remarkable mathematics of which I will never claim to understand whatsoever. But it sounded phenomenal and that was their eureka moment. Ted, thank you so much for talking to me. Your inside knowledge has allowed me to see these images in a whole new way. Thank you. You're very welcome, Fran. It's been great. And we hope that this video and Ted's images allow you to see engineering in a whole new way. And we'd love you to share with us your favourite engineering innovations. Share it on social media using the hashtag engineering inspiration. It could be something that we've mentioned here, or it could be an innovation such as the self-driving car or the Raspberry Pi computer. But please do share and thanks for watching.